Well, welcome everyone to our topic today, which is bullying, what's really going on. My name is Eva D'Agostini. I'm the coordinator of the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management and a school psychologist of many years. And I have with me my co-coordinator, Catherine Cora, if you want to just introduce yourself. Good evening. And so I am also the co-coordinator of uh, the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management. It's been my fourth year, I think. And um, I have been, I am a psychotherapist. I have been in the field for over 15 years and bullying is definitely not new to my uh, expertise. And so looking forward to this topic tonight. Great, thank you, Catherine. So welcome everyone. I, we have people from um, all across the um, province of Quebec because the Centre of Excellence is a support to the 10 English scores of Quebec. We also have people from outside of Quebec. So welcome everyone. It's a delight to have you here. So before I get started with the official part of the presentation, I just want to tell you a little bit about my journey with the topic of bullying. I think it has been a preoccupation probably throughout all of my career as a school psychologist, but certainly 20 years ago when the Center of Excellence was started. Um, you know, I asked what I was supposed to do and they said, well, whatever you want. So I did a variety of things, but I have a very thick dossier on bullying. Figured that was something that we might as well get going on and do something about. And the province of Quebec, as most of the other provinces in Canada, and I'm sure most other school systems across the world are preoccupied with this particular topic and uh, have done taken many, many steps to, to deal with it. But I just want to let you know that um, the material I'm going to be sharing is based on the work of Dr. Gordon Neufeld. And 20 years ago, when I started looking into the topic, I uh, actually had the uh, opportunity to attend a, the first Canadian anti-violence, anti-bullying conference that was held in, um, in Ottawa. And it was in the early 2000s, I think 2002. And it was a three-day workshop, a three-day conference. All the big wigs were there. They invited top, top, top-notch people. And um, it was uh, a conference that also went into Saturday morning, which is quite unusual these days. So I was staying with a friend and she said, where are you going? It's Saturday. I said, oh, another half day of conference. And honestly, by this point, I was up to here. Like I had heard so much and I was just overwhelmed by all of the information, but dutifully went along. And uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, now he was supposed to come for, speak for about an hour, but he got a, little, got a little bit pushed aside because the Minister of Justice decided that he wanted to share his own journey with bullying and his particularly his child's journey with bullying. And so the minutes were ticking away. So by the time this Dr. Gordon Neufeld got to stand up and speak, I think he had maybe 40 minutes left. And I mean, I was really like, okay, come on, let's get going. I want, I want, I want to go, well, you know, I've had it. And he started speaking and I have to tell you, once I heard what he had to say, I was so moved by it because it made so much sense and it was so different from what everyone else was saying. So I did go up to him, I spoke to him, I found out how to get a hold of him. And luckily a few months later, he came to Montreal and we started uh, our, our journey together. So um, it's, it, it was quite something to have been that impressed with that, you know, that number of people that were saying things. So uh, this is one of the reasons why I have, I wanted to share this with you today because it really, really, oops, I think I've got uh, the wrong thing here. Okay, there. I think that um, we, we, uh, we have all the best intentions, all the best intentions of dealing with this particularly difficult situation, especially if you have a child of your own that has been bullied. Uh, if you watch children that in your school that have been bullied, our heart breaks for them. We try everything that we can do. And it's very, I mean, I've watched the development of the, of the Quebec program. Um, we do so much to try and, and fix it and make it go away. And it just isn't getting any better. So, I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to truly understand, and again, I wish it was my own work, but it's really the work of, of Dr. Neufeld, to really look at this dynamic through a different lens. His, the lens that he looks at, and we're gonna see, that this is all gonna come up as we go through this particular uh, dynamic. He looks at maturation, what's happening in terms of the overall development of the, of the child, uh, what's happening in the child's um, 
what's happening with the child's vulnerability in their in their world. Uh, we know that if you're vulnerable, you put on a shell. If you put on a shell, you can't grow. We've got to take that shell off. And things happen when children put on these defenses, this shell. Um, and of course, how can we help children feel soft enough so that they can grow and mature? And that is the attachment key. And attachment is one of the prime instincts uh, dynamics that Dr. Neufeld has worked with a lot. And so we're going to see attachment taking a prominent role here in our understanding of what is going on with, with the bully. So there are explanations that are around. Four of the big prevailing ones are a power imbalance. So basically the thing is that the bully is taking advantage of the weakness of someone else. But in reality, we all know in our schools, we have some very, very capable kids. They're big, they're strong, they're smart, they're verbal. They could take advantage of every kid in, in the class and yet they don't, and yet they don't. So there has to be more to this dynamic than just one child feeling stronger and feeling that they can push other children around. There's the learned behavior thesis, and this is extremely popular right now. Barbara Coloroso has written a book on it, which is basically says that, oh, well, these children just don't have good social emotional skills. Oh, they just don't know any better. We've got to teach them how to get along with other children. But as many of you know, you have taken the child who is doing the bullying aside, worked with them on their social emotional skills, and it keeps popping up. So it's got to be more to it than just the fact that the, this is a, you know inappropriately learned behavior. The empathy failure thesis. Oh, they don't understand how much it hurts. And we're going to see why, what, what, what comes along here. And it's way more than just not understanding that it doesn't hurt, although that is part of it as well. And then the sense of entitlement. You know, we say, oh, well, we're raising all these spoiled kids who just think that they can do whatever they want to do. And there is a certain truth to that, but it is way more than just that as well. So we're going to, to take another spin on this. And Dr. Neufeld says, let's take a look at this through the lens of attachment and our attachment instincts. So the background information, of course, is that we are all creatures of attachment. Um, we, we count on it as human beings. It's the strongest of our instincts. Uh, it even overrides things like hunger and whatever, because we know that when we are in attachment, we're going to survive. It's our preeminent need. And it's the most powerful force in behavior and in personality. We're going to actually see that in terms of our own personalities. Most of us have, have some attachment little kind of things that go on in our personality that affect who we are and who we've become. It is orchestrated by the limbic system of the brain, which is basically the emotional part of our brain. It's deep inside the brain. It is wired and anchored deeply inside of us to make sure that we survive. And so these are instincts. I think Dr. Neufeld at one point said there were something like 35 attachment instincts. We will talk about a few of them today. I've never actually had a list of all 35. There are probably more because this isn't something that we consciously think about. So we don't necessarily have all of those, but there are many of these things that come spontaneously spontaneously, naturally, they flow from us because of how we are wired as human beings. Now, the primary purpose of attachment is to facilitate dependence and caretaking. So it's, it's not really about an egalitarian relationship. It's really about a hierarchy that, that arranges our, our interaction, that works on our interaction. And I'll show you in a moment how it is meant to work. And in keeping with the purpose of attachment, we have our basic sets of attachment instincts, our alpha instincts and our dependent instincts. And then these drives called seeking and providing. And what it is, what's happening here is that this is meant to ensure that attachment happens. It's meant to assure that the children in our care attach to us and allow us to guide them and to take care of them. So here we have our dependent instincts, our alpha instincts, the seeking, the providing, and they are meant to come together in a complementary fashion so that they, they kind of complement each other at appropriate times in appropriate ways. And when all is working well, we are going to be able to do do our job as an adult, and children are going to feel cared for by us. So in the seeking mode, a child comes to us with their dependent instincts, and they want to get their bearings. They want to seek assistance, 
Can you help me? Can you show me? Um, you know, uh, oh, you're my teacher, please teach me. These are all part of that, that, that the instincts and the drives that are there to look up to, to want to follow, to want to belong, to, uh, to look for guidance. These are all part of when we are, when a child is in seeking mode, these are all the things that that uh, that they look to us for, whether we're their parent, whether we're their teacher. And when they are in that mode, it activates the alpha instincts. And many of you know, you've got students that are really easy to take care of. You know, they come naturally to us. Oh, I don't know what to do. Could you help me, please? Am I doing the right thing? And when they do that, it is pretty easy for us to actually take care of them because it kicks in our own alpha instincts. And when we are in our alpha instincts, we are just, it kind of flows from us to orient and inform, to protect and defend, to guide and direct, to look out for, to possess, to lead, to really want to take care of our children in every possible way. Um, and we all know, we, we all have alpha instincts, little two-year-olds. The um, last time when I, the last presentation that I gave on managing, uh, managing behavior without rewards, we talked about eight, uh, 20 month olds who were put into a circumstance where they were, you know, where it would have been a nice thing if they helped, and they did. The 20 month olds knew when they had to help because that was their alpha instincts. Now, 20 months old aren't very good at how to help. If any of you have, have had a new little baby in your house and you have a toddler, you know that the toddler might want to kind of pet the pat the child, but in a way that's not that appropriate. But the instinct to care is there. It's part of who we are. And when we move into caring, into caring mode, it should activate the dependent instincts. And many of you, just about all of you in education are very, very good at taking this alpha role. We talk about taking our place, taking charge, you know, being the one in charge, being the one where the buck stops. And when we are in that mode, most of the kids in our classroom are quite willing to follow us. And many of you have the look, you know, you stand up and you go, children, you know, and the kids know, okay, it, the teacher means business. Now she's in charge. Now he's in charge. And they, many of them just settle down into the dependent mode. So this is sort of the natural way in which it happens. What's really interesting is this is the way in which attachment works, even for us as adults. So you have a best friend. Now, we would say this is an equal relationship. We're going to make decisions together. We're going to do things together. It's going to be egalitarian. But in reality, who is our best friend? Our best friend is someone who takes care of us when we need help, but who also lets us take care of them when they need help. Same with a spouse, same with, uh, with you know, any kind of an adult relationship. It is meant to go back and forth, to flip back and forth between the two different modes. And that is when a relationship is satisfying. It doesn't have to be the same all the time. If your friend has a, an illness in the family, you might take care of your friend for months on, on end. But when all that is over and then you need help, they will take care of you. So it's very important for us to understand that this hierarchy of providing and receiving is important for us as human beings. Now, with the adult and the child, of course, it should always be the adult who provides for the child. The child is meant to be in a dependent relationship. We can give them sometimes when they can be in charge, no question at all. And many of you do that when you provide activities in the classroom. But the bottom line is, at some point, you say, students, children, it's time now to stop. Let's get going. And so you get back into that alpha role. So what's meant to happen here is that um, these alpha dependent drives are meant to be fluid and responsive to the situation or the relationship. Um, so for example, if you are best friends with the the principal in your school. When you're friends, you're going to go more back and forth. When, you're, when your friend becomes, is the principal and now walks into the staff room and says, you know, says, gives directive to the staff, then you know that in that situation, you're not going to be constantly challenging your friend because the role is that your friend is now the, 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 the principal of the school. So you, you, we're supposed to know when is the right time to kind of act more as equals and when is the right time to be in the appropriate level of relationship. But we all have the, 
these alpha instincts especially, and we'll talk a little bit at the end about what happens with dependent instincts, but alpha instincts can sometimes become stuck. We call this the alpha complex. And what it means is that, and we're going to look in a moment at what, what some of the, the characteristics of the alpha uh, dynamic. But when we are stuck in alpha, we kind of get stuff stuck in that leadership role, which means that we are sometimes bossy, controlling and demanding when we really shouldn't be. That we are sometimes wanting to always be on the top, be the one that's you know kind of in the front, be the one that sort of says the last word. We are often people that have a very hard time finding our dependent mode. We don't like to take directions. We don't like to not know what we're doing. We don't like to ask for help. Uh, we are often driven to trump and have the last word and kind of like to be sort of a, a know-it-all or have the, the answer. Now, most people, I would say, in fact, if you want to be a good teacher, if you want to be a good consultant, you kind of have to have a bit of an alpha complex because you kind of have to have this kind of desire to lead people and do things for people. Um, so the alpha complex is actually necessary for leadership. The only thing about an alpha complex is it can get extremely exhausting when we can't let go. So one of the things we need to understand is that to fulfill our provider role, our limbic system, and so this is again where the instincts come in, move us to do three big things. One is to assert dominance. So to assert, take our place. We are going to take the lead. We're going to take control. We're going to give directions. We're going to command attention. Uh, we're going to be in the know. We're going to provide the answers. We're going to try and interact and, and sort of have the last word. Uh, these are all things that are necessary for us as a leader. If you've ever known someone in a leadership role who keeps kind of backing down, you know that it can become quite frustrating because at some point somebody has to be in charge. You can't have too many people in charge. So this is what has to happen. And so that's why, again, when you're in that mode, when you're in that alpha mode, you can kind of seem bossy. But there are two other movements, emotional movements that come along with it. And these are that you are also moved to assume responsibility, to make things work. And as a result, whenever you're in a leadership role, you are going to feel guilty because you're going to know you will not be able to meet everyone's needs. This is one of the things about parenting is the, you know, here you are going to be the primary caretaker of a child. You're going to do everything that the child needs, but now you start to feel guilty about all the times you can't get it quite right. And you cannot be a leader. You cannot be a parent. You cannot be a teacher. You cannot be a consultant without also feelings of guilt because the feelings of guilt are what temper us, temper us from becoming too bossy, from asking too much, from pushing, being too pushy. And it's also tempered by the desire to care for and care about, to be concerned, to meet the needs, to provide what is needed, to, to bear the burdens. Um, you know, we many of you, again, in the teaching role, know that you have to push your kids a little bit to do more than they think they can. But then you also know, and I had a lovely, lovely teacher tell me this, she said, I expect my children to sit quietly, to put their hands on their desk and to wait for me to give them directions. And then she said it with a little smile in her eye, but I know that Billy can only do it for a minute. So I make sure that after a minute, I allow him to get up and do something. So she had that sense of, I have to be in the lead, I have to let my kids know what to do, but she also cared about the ones that couldn't quite do it. It's a beautiful thing when it works well. Very, very beautiful. The other thing that happens inside of our brain is that in order to be the provider, we have to be able to pay attention to certain things. So it's really, really important that we notice vulnerability. And we also, very important, that we notice when there are perceived alpha challenges, because we have to note, so when you note a lack of reference, uh, deference or respect, you have to realize, oh my goodness, if they won't listen to me, I can't lead them. And teachers are very sensitive to that. As psychologists, we're more sensitive to the vulnerabilities, to the fear and the confusion. And when we see that, when we notice these things, when we notice the right relationship kind of falling out of sync, we are moved to assert dominance. And this is where teachers just do that little look. No, no, kids, I'm the one in charge. 
assume responsibility. Here, let me help you. And here, let me take you care of you. So this is what happens to us. This is the natural way it is. But as humans, we are easily wounded. And when we are wounded, we it's really hard to live with vulnerable feelings. And the emotions of caring and responsibility are much more vulnerable than those associated with dominance. And these are the first ones that tend to get numbed out. So what happens here is that the quest for dominance remains, but responsibility and caring about leaves. And Dr. Neufeld calls this alpha awry. When the alpha instincts and uh, alpha attachment instincts to dominate are no longer tempered by caring and responsibility. And now the bully instinct is born. And we call it the bully instinct because sometimes when you are in that mode, and every one of us, by the way, who has a bit of an alpha complex, can sometimes find ourselves in a mode where we're not very empathetic towards other people and we just want to push them around and make them do things. Um, so it's an instinct that all of us has when certain conditions arise. So the quest for dominance becomes divorced from its intended purpose, the alpha instincts become somewhat perverted, and now Unfortunately, the signs of vulnerability evoke exploitation rather than caretaking. So this is, again, one of the things that we often notice about bullies is they seem to know where the vulnerable kids are. We sometimes, unfortunately, have to solve a bullying problem by moving a child who has become the victim of the bully into another school. And some of the research has shown us that unless we handle that very, very carefully, Within a very short amount of time, that child can become the victim again in the new school because the bullies in the new school see a kid who is new, who's uncertain, and boom, away they go. They find that kid. So, of course, how do they do it? They do it through fear, intimidation, through puts down, shaming, and humiliation, exposing and embarrassing, tricking and conning, all of these things. But the bully remains highly sensitized to vulnerability and challenges to the alpha position. So what happens here is that the bully notices more than other people do who the weak ones are, partly because their own weakness, their own vulnerability is a very uncomfortable state for them. And part of what they do is they're trying to get rid of people who remind them of being vulnerable. I remember Dr. Phil actually had a whole series uh, on, on bullying and he put out a call. Hey, if you're a bully, do you want to contact me, please? I'm going to be happy to interview you. And wouldn't you know it, of course, when you're defended against feelings of vulnerability, you don't, it doesn't bother you to go on national TV to tell millions of people that you're a bully. And this woman said, and she had been a terrible bully to her uh, stepsister who was who had Down syndrome, and she had terrible. She said, "We shouldn't we shouldn't have to see people like that." Oh, she couldn't handle her own vulnerability, and of course, the bullies are extremely sensitive to perceived alpha challenges, a lack of deference, a lack of submission, a lack of compliance. Um, one of the things that happens when we deal in, with the dynamic of what we call the girl bullies, it's a bit of a different dynamic than with the boys, but a lack of deference or a lack of respect can come about so quickly. The queen bee basically dictates what the rest of the kids, the, you know, the, in part of in her circle do, the wannabes. The queen bee tells them, your hair has to be short, your hair has to be long, you have to wear these kinds of shoes. And so here's this little girl who's part of this group for whatever reason, and her parents can't afford to buy the expensive shoes, partly because they need to buy other stuff. And the little girl says, no, mommy, buy the ballet shoes or buy my soccer shoes. It's okay. And so she comes to school and doesn't buy the new shoes. Now the queen bee is really upset. Because in her mind, this little girl is showing a lack of deference, a lack of respect. So when they notice these things, with, but because of their defense, defensive filters, they are moved to assert dominance, but caring and responsibility are no longer there. So it's the Alpha Arise series. The bully instinct results from natural alpha instincts perverted by emotional defendedness. And so what we have is kind of an equation, alpha complex, defended against caring responsibility, that becomes, that is that, that invokes the bully instinct. And when it is situational, it stays kind of instinctual. It can kind of come and go. Sometimes with some people, we, we find it more than with others. Uh, but when it becomes a signature 
trait of the personality, now it becomes the syndrome. So with this alpha array, basically, now we understand that bullying is deeply rooted in the natural attachment instincts and that they're, that are perverted by emotional defendedness, which now explains both the bully personality and also the current escalation in bullying because many, because for a whole bunch of reasons and right now that we are in the middle of a, a global pandemic, our own sense of vulnerability is very high. Many of us are having to numb out our vulnerability. And when we do, it can affect how well we can manage or temper our desire to dominate. So we are seeing more and more bullying happening simply because there's more and more vulnerability in the world and more and more defendedness that's happening. And it leads us then to surprising solutions, which actually often run counter to the prevailing approaches. And we won't be talking about that tonight, but we will be talking about that in our next session. So where does this come from? Well, it comes from an alpha complex. And where does the alpha complex, what does the alpha complex do? Well, they don't like being parented or taught or told what to do. And they don't like to be, yeah, they don't like to be told what to do. So one of the first characteristics, highly predisposed to, to resist the will of others, um, as even those they're attached to because of this elevated counter will. And why is that? Well, because of the alpha instincts, it doesn't feel right to be told by others what to do uh, or to do the build bidding of others. And of course, uh, because of the defendedness, they also don't really have a good sense of who they are. And so they, they kind of have to protect whatever that sense is. So many bullies do qualify for a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder. Um, the other thing that happens is that they become fearless, tearless, and untempered in their experience and expression. Why is that? Well, again, highly alarmed feelings. They are highly alarmed. There's a lot of alarm in there for them, but they're defended against feelings of alarm. Because feelings of alarm um, actually are, are make us very vulnerable. And so they are scared, but they don't want to admit that they're scared. Um, I remember a situation of a little guy who was in a psych one of the psychiatric programs in Montreal, and we, they have a habit of bringing these children back one day a week. And so he, of course, of course, he was in a program. He knew he was in a program for dealing with his severe behavior problems at a hospital. He was put on this bus and brought to a school where he didn't know anyone. Of course, he had huge, huge alarm. And the people that were taking care of them, if he had said to them, I'm so scared when I get off the bus that the other kids are going to hurt me, which means he now has to live with his alarmed feelings, they would have been able to help him. But he didn't. He got off the bus, he took one look around, around, the, uh, around the yard, and he started picking on kids. He didn't look scared, but oh my goodness, was he ever scared. And they can be fearless in terms of, you know, with agitation without apprehension, where they just don't talk about being scared or where they're careless and, and have a hard time staying out of harm way or have a lot of time with, with, uh, with having a sort of focused attention. Or they can also be so defended against alarm that they are now actually attracted to that which alarms. Um, that they, um, they, don't, they don't even seem very agitated, but they get an adrenaline rush from doing alarming things. Because for most of us, when we have an adrenaline rush, it doesn't feel very comfortable, but they don't feel that discomfort and they actually seek that rush. And so they establish their dominance by getting a charge out of alarming others. Um, they're tearless because again, feeling your sadness about what does not work, grief, disappointment, which are essential for us to actually move through some of the challenging things that we live in our life. These are lost when we're defended against other vulnerable feelings such as caring and responsibility. Um, they are unable to adapt to their circumstances and what they can't change in their life. They don't learn from consequences and failures. Now, some of these kids look like they're learning from consequences or failures. So they will stop doing. And this is one of the things that is a, a, it has been very concerning to me because we have, in effect, made it very clear to, to kids that they can't do certain things in our schools. But these kids stop doing it at school, but they keep doing it other places. They, they used to do it in the olden days in the park. 
Now they do it online. Now they do it behind, you know, they do it in places where we can't see. So they, they aren't actually adapting when they look like they're stopping. Um, they, they don't have a plasticity in their brain. And many of them also have learning disabilities as a result of that. Um, and they don't get, they don't get that sometimes you can't make someone what to do, right? So they establish their dominance as well as they get a charge out of making others cry. I can make you cry. I know I'm the one that's in charge. I know that I'm the one that's kind of on the top. I'm, I'm the queen bee if I can make you cry. And when they're untempered, they just don't feel this discord because that requires the, the development of the prefrontal cortex. But when you are so protecting yourself, your prefrontal cortex actually doesn't grow very well. So again, a lot of these kids don't have the flexibility that comes with that prefrontal cortex. And again, they are defended against these vulnerable feelings. And we need to have vulnerable feelings. There are some vulnerable feelings that actually temper some of our other feelings, uh, you know, some of our emotions. And so basically, Futility and sadness, caring and responsibility. Um, those are feelings that temper some of the other things. Um, the other, so all of many of all of these, their, their vulnerable feelings are defended against, but notice one thing. They also are defended against appreciation, thankfulness, gratefulness. They are, are also um, uh, against any kind of joy and delight feelings of fulfillment. So many of these kids who have this huge amount of defendedness actually also have a very flat emotional world. Part of the reason why they are so attracted to the adrenaline rush, because, you know, many of us, when we look at something beautiful, um, you know, we've just had snow recently, you know, on that perfect day when the snow is beautifully white and the sun is out and its sky is blue and it's reflecting, as much as we don't like digging ourselves out of snowbanks or what have you, but there's that moment when you look at that beauty, the beauty of a sunset, and you're just filled with these lovely feelings. But when you're defended against that, you don't. And so you seek adrenaline rush, something that tells you that you're a feeling being. So, so these are parts of what happened with, with the, the bully personality. Then there are some other things that come from the two of these things sort of joined together. An attitude of entitlement, highly sensitized to slight, a predisposition to aggression, and a distorted attachment behavior. Entitled, bullies feel they have to get their own way. And why is that? Well, because kind of forcing their way through this, you know, establishing dominance and sensitive alpha way of doing it makes them feel right. I think this is the key sentence for me when I'm when I come in, in into contact with a child who's involved in bullying behaviors, because what you have to see is that the bullies don't feel taken care of, so they must take care of themselves. And I know that, uh, again, sometimes, I mean, again, if, if I think back to that interview of that woman with Dr. Phil, I mean, she just looked at him like, don't you get it? We got to get rid of these people. And, you know, to give Dr. Phil credit, he actually did a little bit more of an interview with her and found out when she hadn't felt cared for in her life. Now, he wasn't able to make all of these links, but she had had many times when the people in her life had not taken care of her of her and this is how she had to take care of herself so again this is going to help us in our interventions they don't get the futility they don't realize that sometimes you just can't get your way and you've got to grieve what you cannot you cannot do and they don't have a lot of resilience they don't have a way of bouncing back the, my way is the highway that's the only thing that they're able to do and of course they become a very demanding personality which then can cause problems when they grow into adulthood they're sensitive to slight. And I'd already mentioned that when I talked about, about the, uh, the queen bee who notices the lack of deference. Again, if she wants to stay the queen bee, she has to make sure that all her wannabes are doing her bidding. And exactly because of that sensitization, they notice any lack of dis disrespect, any lack of deference. As I say, it might be slightly different uh, among certain groups, uh, maybe female versus male. Again, as we all know with female and male behavior, it's all along a continuum. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Males as well can be very sensitive to a lack of deference. Uh, in 
our society, generally in our culture, eye contact, especially among males, is a very critical thing. Uh, and sometimes, again, uh, the you ask someone, well, why did you pick on that kid? He didn't look at me right. You know, and again, they don't even understand what they're asking, but they just know if, if a kid looks at me and they aren't giving me proper deference, I got to put that person in their place. And we have to be so careful. There are some of our kids, especially in our high schools, who cannot raise their eyes when they're walking in the corridor because they know if they look up, everyone's going to pick on them. Um, and the most more defended the bully is, oh, this is an interesting one. The more defended a bully is to the rejection from those who are important to them, the more sensitized to slight for those who do not matter to them. Because if a bully, and we're going to look at where some of the dynamics comes from, but if the bully has been rejected by their father or, or by their mother, or people that are really, really important to them in their life, having to name that, having to, to express that is very difficult for them. It's so hard for them. And yet, that sense of being rejected, it just lives with them and builds up in them. And so when they see the hint of rejection from someone that's not important at all, they jump on it. It's kind of like their brain latch, latches onto a solution. And so sometimes, you know, we are totally, we don't get it. This kid didn't do anything to deserve this. You know, why is the bully picking on them? Well, because there's something way deeper underneath. They have a distorted attachment dynamic. It's intense, but superficial and depersonalized and wounding. Why is it intense? Well, because unfortunately, first of all, they are lacking. They have a huge need for attachment because their attachment world isn't working, but also because attachment is a vulnerable business. And so the flight from vulnerability is going to affect how they do it. They're going to keep it superficial and depersonalized, and there's not going to be a lot of intimacy. Uh, Dr. Neufeld has his six levels of attachment, his roots of attachment, which go down to the deepest level of being known. Well, the bully can only operate at the level of the senses and at the level of sameness, uh, maybe at belonging and loyalty. They can't go deeper because deeper opens them to being rejected, to being hurt. You know, the more you give your heart away, the more your heart can be broken and they just can't do it. And so they have, they try and make it, they try and gather a gang around them. Uh, they, they try and, you know, kind of pad their attachment world through very superficial kinds of attachments. And of course, as a result, they can be extremely wounding. That little girl who, who decided not to buy the shoes for a very good reason is going to be completely stunned when the queen bee doesn't understand that she had a good reason for doing it. There is no back and forth in the queen bee wannabes relationship. It's all about the queen bee needing it. And so very wounding because you didn't buy the right shoes. You can't be our friend anymore. And they back into attachment. And this is, again, another situation that we need to understand, because backing into attachment can actually be a very kind of interesting, dangerous, confusing dynamic. So they can't go to somebody and say, I want to be your friend. Do you want to be part of my gang? I need a few more people around me so that I can feel safe in this school whatever, you know, and, and people, kids do that. They, they, they go up to other kids and they say, you want to be my friend? You know, oh, good, we can do things together. I mean, because when you say, do you want to be my friend? The person can say, no, not now. And, well, bullies cannot handle that. So what they do is they recruit people by actually picking on somebody else. And this is one of the times when a random kid can become a victim because the bully isn't trying to victimize the kid. The bully is actually recruiting someone to come into their gang. Now, the problem with this whole dynamic is that most kids in a school honestly know who the bullies are. The instinctive fear of being dominated by someone who's unkind is very strong. Kids know it. And sensitive kids, particularly, but most kids know it. And we're going to talk about a group of kids who kind of don't get it, but most kids kind of know it. But they're in a bind because if they're standing beside the bully and the bully's deciding to recruit and thinks, oh, this is going to be a kid who'll, who'll come and join me, they'll say, oh, look at that kid. Look at the weird glasses he's wearing. Now, we're all training our kids not to say mean things about other kids. But remember, our kids also have instincts. And this kid is standing beside the bully and going, uh-oh. I'm in a bind right now because if I disagree with the bully, he could maybe turn on me and I could become the next victim. But, you know, what am I going to do? Now, a really 
well, a kid with, you know, good social skills, good, good kind of, you know, this intelligence, this ability to kind of put all things together might go, ha, 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 oh, I need to go to the bathroom and find an excuse to get out of there that's not going to trigger the bully into, into picking on them. But let's say you're new to the school or let's, you know, let's say you really do see this bully as kind of the answer because, you know, this is a strong kid. This is the queen bee. She's got all her friends. If I'm part of that group, I'm part of the cool group. So now you go, <laughs> yeah. And so now the bully bull brings you in. And of course, unfortunately, you get caught in this terrible dynamic because the more you agree with the bully, the more happy, the happier the bully is to have you part of the group. But again, any child who has the least little bit of kind of integrative ability, no integrative thinking, knows that I've done something wrong. And we have to be so careful. And again, when we get into, into, into ways of intervening, we have to be so careful because now the kid is scared to come to the adults because they know they've done something wrong. But that's how the bully gets them. And the bully says, well, we can't talk to adults and we don't like adults. And now you get hooked in. It's backing into attachment. And unfortunately, they suck other kids in and keep them attached to them and then can continue to do what they need to do. Very important to understand these kinds of dynamics. Now, so this is the picture of the bully personality. So how are bullies made? Well, first we have to look at, well, how is the alpha complex happen? How does it come about? Well, it can come about in two ways. It can come about by default or by defense. Default is when adults do not assume an alpha posture or convey an alpha presence. It's kind of like something, it's just kind of a lack. But alpha by defense happens when it does not feel safe to depend. Now let's go look at alpha by default. Parents reacting to their own background, a perfect example of that. Um, someone that I was working with um, who basically said to me, he said, you know, I, I had a rough, rough childhood. My parents were very, my, my dad was particularly bad with me, very mean to me. And he had two little kids, a two-year-old and a three-year-old. And he said, you know what, I'm not going to raise them the way my father raised them. So in my house, he said, um, they, I give them, I give them timeouts. That's what he was using. He said, I give them timeouts. And he says, but it's okay, because I let them give me a timeout. Now, every one of you, <laughs> since most of you have a good, strong alpha complex, are just like shaking your head because you intuitively know that if the dad gives space to the children to, to treat him, you know, to be in the alpha mode for, to him, it's going to be trouble because we can't, when alpha, alpha does not do well in any kind of a void, the minute, and many of you know this, if, if, if you have a particularly difficult group of students, you know that some students you can say to them, I feel sick, you know, and they will, they will just cooperate with you. Other groups, you say, I'm not feeling very well today, and boom, they start acting out, because alpha can't handle a void. When, you know, there's, there's a space, when the alpha goes, oh, well, whatever, then the kid becomes the alpha. And parents, unfortunately, it can be done through that. It can be done through a failure of our culture to script out uh, um, alpha posturing. We don't feel very comfortable. We always talk about Canadians. We always apologize. And <clears throat> I'm so sorry. And we're so modest. We don't, you know, it's hard for us to be that person that takes our place with confidence. Now, most of you, you do pretty well at that. Um, weak or inadequate parenting. Sometimes the parent just, you know, is sick. And, and, and so you have to step into that space. Parents looking to children to fulfill their needs. I remember one mom saying, in, again, in a meeting, oh, you know, he's my big man. He's the man of the house. Um, they can't do that. If we minute we say to a child, you're the man of the house, we put them into alpha by default. If we parent on demand or egalitarian parenting, like this dad was trying to do, I let, we can't. Somewhere the parent, the child needs to know the buck stops somewhere. And I mean, honestly, uh, you know, my one of one of my children, my daughter has a bit of an alpha complex for a variety of different reasons. But one of them was because I was trying too hard to be egalitarian um, or child led. Um, and sometimes we have to be very careful also as parents not to let kids know that we need help with our parenting. So sometimes Dr. Neufeld would just shake his head when parents would say, oh, I'm reading your book with my kids. 
no, 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 your kids don't can't even know that you're reading that book because you need to give the answer. And again, many of you, those of you that are teachers, you kind of know that you, you're very good at making make looking like and I know the pandemic has made you do that looking like you're much more confident that you are. So inadvertently, some of our kids can become alpha by default. But alpha by defense, and you can, by the way, have both of those comes when there was a separation too much to bear, when you are not feeling cared for by by your parents and sometimes that can happen when a parent for example has another child who's particular has special needs and particularly difficult to care for so you can you know you you're, you basically sometimes your parent says you got to be help me with with this child but sometimes the child reads it as you're not taking care of me or being bullied by by parents by peers by other adults feeling abused or exploited a uh, feeling ex or um extremely vulnerable or oversensitive. Um, and, you know, many of our children on the autism spectrum are actually also alpha by defense because they basically, we can't understand how difficult life is for them when every little clothing tag drives them nuts, when every little noise in the environment drives them nuts, when we just can't do that. I mean, uh, you know, very often we, we don't understand why the child is always distressed. And so then they start to take care of themselves. They become alpha by defense. And then we have sometimes have practices where people continually take things away from kids, where kids are basically feeling like you don't care about me because you're always taking things away. Or it can be experiencing alarming situations or circumstances for far too long. Living in um, a community, living in a, in a part of, of, of the city where there are constantly, you know, sirens going, um, guns going off, uh, violence happening all the time, that as well can cause alpha by defense. And this also ties in with getting becoming defended against caring and responsibility. So the especially alpha by defense and becoming defended against caring and responsibility can sometimes go together. Um, but with when you become very highly defended against caring and responsibility due to significant wounding or overwhelming sensitivity, then you can go into the other mode. So basically, the overwhelming sensitivity comes from genetics. You're born with a predisposition. It can be towards uh, autism spectrum disorder, um, Tourette syndrome, uh, other kinds of syndromes. Um, so you have this predisposition that's inside of you that makes things much hard, makes life much harder for you to handle. Or, as we now know, with all the studies that are done on prenatal stress, um, that if the mother has experienced a lot of stress in the um, during the, the time of, uh, of of her pregnancy, that that the cortisol, the adrenaline actually affect the development of the nervous system of the baby. And the baby can be one of those really, really difficult children, babies to handle. Um, and then of course it, it can do that. Or if there's something that happens during the birth that can then also affect kind of the, the, the sort of the, the alarm level of the child. But then of course, we have the defended against wounds too much to bear facing too much separation. And again, this is one of the reasons if we look into the history of the children who are in the bullying dynamic, we very often find stories of um, foster care, many, many foster homes, um, many, many situations of a lot of contention between the mother and the father, the father and the mother, even situations in which one of the parents who was the primary caretaker of the child has um, um, partners, you know, that come through the home, you know, a two, three, four uh, boyfriends, girlfriends that came through the home, which again causes continual separation for this particular child. And also a sense on the child's part that my parent is, is more wanting to take care of other people, not wanting to take care, take care of me. So those multiple separations can cause huge amounts of defendedness. Feeling too alarmed for too long, um, again, uh, if you live in circumstances in which there's constant alarm and a little bit of what's happening right now, we have had, you know, nearly getting on to two years of constant high alarm in our system. And so there are some kids that there's always they're moving, uh, the parents, their parents are having a hard time with providing them with enough food with a safe place to live, and so on and so forth. So these children live in a constant state of alarm. Um, and that really affects their ability, they just have to at some point put that shell on and just numb it out. 
or experiencing being shamed or humiliating or, or humiliated or feeling as if there, something is wrong with one. Um, we were, I was talking with uh, some of my colleagues today about children um, who, who have Tourette syndrome. Until the syndrome gets diagnosed, these children have these ticks. They have these things that keep manifesting themselves, which is part of the genetic predisposition that they have, but it's made worse. And, and again, no parent is doing this on purpose, but sometimes we, you know, we say to the child, come on, stop that. And we think it's a choice behavior. Then when they get the, the diagnosis of Tourette syndrome, we go, oh my goodness, I didn't know that. Oh, so sometimes our frustration with what's happening in the sensitivity world of the child can then make the child on top of that feel too humiliated there's something wrong with them why can't you be like your brother why can't you be like your sister why can't you just behave and those things then can cause a child to numb out any vulnerable feelings that they have so the last thing that i want to add in here is that we basically have the whole phenomenon of peer orientation this is when peers become more important than adults uh, there is always a hierarchy it is absolutely natural. Again, all of you know in the classroom, literally on the second day of school already, there's a little bit of a hierarchy, a pecking order in the class. In a well-functioning class, that pecking order changes depending on the subject, depending on what's happening. But when a bully becomes attached to the peers, there is that pecking order that must be done. But there's no, no sense of responsibility or caring. 10-year-old bully cannot take care of other 10-year-olds. And when they matter more to each other, they can get hurt more by each other. This is the phenomenon that's happening with social media right now. Our kids are becoming very peer attached and even the lack of a like can cause hurt. And of course, in pop culture, vulnerability is shamed. Shamed, don't be, you know, oh, your baby, don't cry, whatever. And invulnerability is venerated. So that is why some kids are attracted to being with bullies because they see them as being tough, as being the ones that could protect them from the rest of the kids in the school. And it causes problems. The making of some of our victims follows this path as well. And this is where we can, rather than having an alpha complex, some of our children can actually have a dependent complex where they, uh, instead of flipping into alpha mode, they flip into dependent mode. And so they're terribly predisposed to defer and to depend upon others. Now, if they depend upon us as the adults, it's not a problem. But if they look to their peers and want their peers to take care of them, it makes them very vulnerable to the sensitive relating. And they try and elicit caretaking and protection by opening themselves. Oh, you know, that really hurts my feelings or, you know, please, please let me play with you. And they still beg for these kids to take care of them. And well, for the bully, that's just a red flag that says, woohoo, I've got a victim here. Yay. I'm not blaming the victims. I'm just saying that sadly, some of our children, because of their defendedness, and many of them have the same pattern of, of, of issues in their past life that makes them numb out vulnerable feelings. You know, we get upset when our kid comes home and says, you know, um, I couldn't go, I, I had to wait to go to the bathroom because there was this big guy in the hallway and I didn't want to go past him to go to the bathroom. And we get really upset that you shouldn't be scared of any kid in the hallway. But you know what? That shows that our kids are still feeling their fear. But some of these kids have had to numb out those feelings and so they will walk into trouble. You know, and so they have blind spots and they keep going. And some of you see that um, Deborah Pepler noted that she's a, one of our wonderful Canadian um, researchers on bullying. She said, why are there some of these kids that keep walking back into trouble, walking back into trouble? Well, for some of them, it's around this defendedness. You know, many of our kids, if they can feel their sad feelings, like they want to be part of the queen bees and the wannabes, but they aren't, they aren't invited, they have their tears and then they go find another group of friends. But some of these kids can't seem to have their tears. Um, it makes them less resilient, less adaptive. They can't seem to learn on how to stay away from the bullies, how to stay away from difficult situations. And when they are that highly peer oriented, they then are less oriented towards adults and we've had a couple of circumstances um, not these were happened a few years ago but um, and I can't even remember their names now um, but we had a couple of people one girl's name was Amanda and she um, and and she basically went on 
on Facebook and 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 said to her peers, please don't pick on me, please don't pick on me. And um, Dr. Neufeld uh, actually was invited to a an interview with um, uh, Vicki Gabro again a long, long time ago, where there was a mother and a daughter, and the daughter had been bullied, but the daughter was still attached to the mother. And and she was crying and she was upset about the whole interview process. And Vicki Gabro said to Dr. Neufeld, she, he, she said, don't you have to be worried about that child? And Dr. Neufeld said, no, because that child is still referring to her mother. There's things I can do to help that child and that mother to get through this. But but the children, unfortunately, and again, the, the father, I think the, the young woman's name was 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 Raya or something. I can't remember when he, basically the father in the interview said. She didn't talk to me anymore. If she had just come to me, I would have tried to help her. But these kids are moved towards their peers. So when kids come to us and complain about bullying, part of us wants to fix it, but part of us should be happy that they're still orienting towards the adults. So in the making of a bully, this is the whole picture, which includes that a sense that dependence is an aversive state, which includes a sense that, uh, that adults don't take care of me, I have to take care of myself, which assumes that attachments, you know, there aren't natural hierarchies, people aren't actually stepping in and trying to reestablish that sense, I'm going to take care of you. And there is very high peer orientation. So you have to wait until January <laughs> to find out how to unmake bullies. But the interesting thing is, we're going to actually use this equation and bit by bit, piece by piece, unmake the bully by working with the parts that brought the bully to the syndrome that they're in. So thanks again for coming tonight. Um, please either, and Catherine, you're going to post again uh, when yes. you have a moment, the link to our evaluation form and come back on uh, January the 13th to hear intervening with the bully dynamic. And again, as all of you know, please do register for the session, even if you don't think you're going to be able to come. Because when you register for the session, you will be one of the first to actually get a copy of the recording. So I'm going to stop here. And uh, I think I'm going to stop the recording here. Okay. And we'll. Uh...